we utilized um, a lot of, well, five different methods from an electronic survey, which we developed, um, as well as interviews and focus group discussions with the different artisans. And we also um, use a rainbow diagram to come up with a stakeholder identification. And we reviewed a lot of documents along the way. So these are the results and findings of our research. Uh, well, we most of the respondents of the survey no, that we, we uh, sent out, uh, most of the respondents are from Samar, although we just um, had one municipality respondent. Well, you know that Samar is quote unquote the banig or the mat weaving capital of the Philippines, although not yet declared formally, officially, but yeah, they have been no, at the forefront of mat weaving using tikog no, as their material. And um, <clears throat> that's, that's the reason for the number of artisans from that area. Staggering. I think um, a lot of you should look into this slide. Um, we, I reached out um, to a lot of um, artisans, enterprise leaders, as well as enablers um, coming from the government and non-government sector to pass around um, the survey no, for artisans. Uh, and so we were able to reach uh, during the time no frame that we were provided uh, about 91 artisans. And among them, it was so um, glaring no, that 50% or a total of um, 45 out of the 91 that, uh, 46 out of the 91 that we surveyed were age 65 to 74 years old. <clears throat> so when we asked the question first on what was the role of the younger generation, we only assumed no, that um, because it was influenced, no, the artisanal craft in the region were um, dominated by older or um, yeah, much older um, age groups. But yeah, given this data now, and um, you will also see that the 4%, that's the number corresponding to the 15 to 24 age group. <clears throat> Considering that it was um, um, provided no, um, to different communities, artisans, there are really not a lot no, of, um, of um, youth or even those who are older than youth. The 25 to 34 age group no, accounts for 7%. So it increases no by age but by age range but yeah it is really something to point out that there are not a lot of youth no getting involved no um in artisanal crafts and um in arti artisanal work and craft ship no in some in the various places that we um reached out to in summer and late so majority are women so they're really like that's that's why the bias no in terms for us um to be tackling this issue um that um women no are in in the, in this industry no in these areas are mostly affected no by um the <clears throat> by the sustainability of craft ship so even that no not just about how they are taking care of their families, but about taking care of their of the crafts, no, of the culture, of the traditions, no, that are held dear in where they are. <clears throat> um, yeah, so mostly are married. So I'll just run through these slides. Um, <clears throat> I think they will be provided eventually. Um, mostly, mostly of most of the respondents were also household heads, no. Um, so they have care work functions uh yeah in terms of education no um different yeah different um backgrounds but a lot no of our artisans are graduates though, of high school 
<clears throat> it is to be noted no and um 8% no are even graduate um of um from college so however due to the i think lack of demand no um in terms of crafts <clears throat> because um we just are we are still recovering from the pandemic no i'm um, not a lot of them or <clears throat> No, there is there is not much demand. That's why um, not a lot are able to work um, full time um, as artisans. So only forty five point three percent mentioned that they work forty hours no, a, as a week um, as weavers or artisans. So in terms of the craft communities that we reached out to, so these are um, the different no. Um, communities, associations, enterprises that we work with throughout this process, either through the survey, through interviews or discussions. Uh, well, <clears throat> they provided us information on how they access raw materials. Mostly, no, um, they buy it or um, they source it from local farmers in their own areas um, or nearby towns. So. And um, in terms of selling no, their products, they sell it to Pasalubong centers, um, to trade fairs no, that are slowly coming back um, each and every month. So we, it was all on lockdown no, during the pandemic. <clears throat> Same also, so for both summer and late, no, that's how they raw, uh, access um, their raw materials and how they um, access the market. <clears throat> The engagement of the youth, um, well, these are the efforts that they have been doing all throughout. May, I think um, Madam Claire will be able to share also in a, in a while. Um, they usually expose their children. No? They set an example at home no? on how to weave, how to embroider. They also delegate them tasks no? such as braiding. And um, another effort that has been um, quite notable is one of the communities that um, we were able to interview. Uh, they have dedicated no, barangay officials who actually encourage the community to weave. So it's their, it's their um, direction as a barangay and they even provide incentives. So that was really um, something. However, despite these um, things no, that are happening, uh, the thing is, well, due to technology somehow, well, and the low, no, low um, payment or <clears throat> lack of um, productivity from uh, artisanal work. So there's low level of interest on the part of the youth Low in because it's low income work for them for some, and um, they would rather you know, do some things um, using technology and the internet, or they would rather move to the city to find different jobs you know, that they can um, they can uh, land. You know. And also other communities you know, have high reliance on the four piece program uh, because they don't need to work anymore according to them, but rather just wait for the benefits um, that they would receive. So in terms of community-based forest management, um, when asked about how they um, understand, no, they still lack no, um, awareness and understanding on um, CBFM, even though with the occurrence of Yolanda back in 2013. So I think no, um, now for the recommendations, I'll try to um, go faster. But yeah, on policy, it's really the localization of existing um, laws. And at the same time, the passage of other bills, um, specifically that affects no, summer and latest provinces. Um, and then also working with the LGUs on how they can leverage on the Mandana's ruling. Uh, um, in order to benefit craft communities. On services and programs, I think really the continu continuity of support um, through different means. I think um, it's really 
awareness, understanding, and um, further no um, training on CBFM for um, capacity building for the youth if we want to involve them. Um, product development and upgrading to continue no, to provide um, these um, communities, craft communities, access to the market. So it goes hand in hand. If you want to access the market, you really have to level up. And also um, for the different, for, uh, no, for other um, needs, no, they also need digital literacy to pivot no, to the new normal as we refer to the current existing no, um, realities. Um, and then also financial literacy, leadership and management, and as well as business capacity development. So that's um, for the continuity of the services of both the public and the private sector. And um, just to mention also, some of them we were ha we have been able to connect already no, to our existing platform, herstore.asia. Although it is still a work in progress, we really intend no, to build digital literacy on ground, mentor and coach, and as well as um, bring them no, to possible markets here and abroad. Um, on knowledge dissemination, um, the these are the recommendations. Really, um, hopefully, if um, the universities or schools um, within the region or even outside, no, can integrate no in their curriculum um, more no information on art, not just information but um, courses no on arts and crafts, mat weaving, for instance, face-to-face -face sharing sessions of the findings of this research um, on ground, and as well as publication of these materials, which we know no will be available through the British Council's website eventually. And um, on sustainability, I think it's really about involving them. No, Gen Z, we know. Um, they are very much capable, but yeah, we have to get them on board, um, on the sitting, um, on the sitting table, um, have a seat at the table, and at the same time, no plan and um, develop no programs together that would engage them. And um, lastly, no, it's really um, CBFM, um, TOT, no to create more consciousness. Um, for advocacy on gender and green responsive strategies towards craftship and artisanal work. So without further ado, um, so those are the findings of our research. And without further ado, I would like to call on um, my friend, um, uh, one of the weavers artisan enterprises um, from the region, Ms. Clarita Villamor, uh, Manang Claire, um, to share about no, um, her life um, as a weaver, and at the same time, no, how she also sees um the uh, the importance of the youth, no, um in weaving, in sustaining um craftship and artisanal work, artisanal work in summer and winter. So go ahead, Ayan. Yes, yes, po. <clears throat> Pwede mag Tagalog lang. Ma'am, Tagalog. Yes, yes, ma'am. I'll just, ano. Tagalog. I will, ano, I will type your, ano. I'll translate it here. Uh, good afternoon. Oh, good morning, sir. Si ma'am, good morning. Yung ako po, yung, yung ano ko, grade 2 pa lang ako. Marunong na ako mag, ano, mag-wave ng banig. Tapos yung, kayong lula ko, marunong sila. Yan ang kanilang, yan ang kanilang hanap buhay. Nung ano pa sila. Nung, nung, nung maliit pa ako. Tapos yung nanay ko, yan, yan ang hanap buhay din. Tapos, ako, ako ang nag-ano sa kanila. Bali, ano, ano po ma'am, nag, nag, nag nag sunod sa kanilang 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 business marunong ako mag magwave ng banig marunong ako magborda at nagmarunong ako magtahi ng bags ngayon 
Tapos yung mga apo ko nag-aano sila, tinuruan ko ang mga apo ko mag mag wave ng banig at saka magborda. Yung mga anak ko lahat sila marunong magborda, marunong magwave ng banig. Yung mga anak ko. Yan ang hanap buhay ko. Eh nagano ako nag nag-iisip na mayroon isang apo ko na mag mag ano sa magpatuloy ba sa business namin. Yung anak kong isa nag nagano sa akin na mama ako na lang yung mag ano magpapatuloy ng business mo kung maano ka na mag old ka na nga hindi na ako maka 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 ano ng pag 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 trade trade fair yan ang anak ko tapos yung isa kong apo sabi niya lula ako ang mag ano mag ano sa inyong hanap buhay yan mga magrunong na marunong na sila sa ngayon ako pa rin maano pa man ako at mga ma magkusog ma, ma <laughs> bu ngayon ngayon nga ni papunta kami si bu mayroon trade fair doon two two three and four tapos mayroon akong pisto mam carmen na tuloy tuloy na doon sa sibu inanap ako ng pisto doon sa sm nang sabi mo kasamahan natin oo mm -mm. Yan, yan, yan ang ano ko, sir. Sana matulungan po ako. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Welcome po. So, I, yeah, that is, um, that is it from our end. Um, I think, yes, um, involving the youth, no? Involving her grandkids, as she has mentioned. Is really key, you no? Know, eventually, because we will all, I mean, age, um, and we need to pass it on, you no? Know, pay it forward. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for listening to our research findings. Thank you very much, Carmen, and thank you, Kerry Kalita. Um, there are a few things I would like to immediately say uh, in relation to the project. Um, it's wonderful to see another one of the sustainable development goals being addressed through the project. And uh, this time, for those who are not aware, um, this is goal five, which is achieving gender equality and empowering all women and girls. So uh, along with the others that we were mentioning yesterday, um, Carmen has introduced a, a new uh, particular sustainable development goal, as well as the ones that we were covering uh, on Monday, sorry, on Tuesday. Um, I think also having been involved with a number of different weaving traditions in different parts of the world, the issue that you identify about the older generation being the holders of knowledge, but the issue about how do you transfer how do you get younger people interested? How do you explain the relevance and why it's an important thing for the community as well as for individuals is a very important part, but it's one that's shared as a problem by many uh, weaving communities across the world. So I've seen the same issue in different projects uh, in different countries. Uh, I would mention that you may find it interesting to look at the um, Shetland weavers. So this is a group of islands off the north of Scotland, uh, and they have school classes for the children. They have a textile tradition of knitting, um, which is very long standing, and the children have school classes in knitting now. So if you want an example of how this can be implemented, I think that may be something to uh, to look at they have a very good online presence as well uh, and this connects with another aspect of talking to export markets that there are a large number of people who are interested in Scottish heritage uh, in America and they help support the Shetland weavers I, I can see I, <laughs> there's enthusiastic 
<laughs> support there. So um, these are things that we can uh, think about transferring knowledge from one project to another. And I think this is one of the things that the British Council connection um, that we can think about how we can help support through identifying other places where the same issues have happened and how they might be able to support um, new developments across the Philippines. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Carmen. Thank you, Clarita. Uh, that was uh, a wonderful uh, introduction, a start to the session. A quick rem reminder to all the audience, if they have any questions for Carmen and Clarita or any of the other speakers for the other two presentations, please type them into the Q&A box when they come to your mind, and then we'll have them ready uh, when we're uh, having the session at the end of the day, or we may be able to have a, a short one uh, beforehand. So our next speaker for the next presentation is Professor Eric Baba Zaruda. Professor Zaruda is currently the director of the University of Santo Tomas Graduate School Center for the Conservation of Cultural Property of Environment in the Tropics. He is also an associate professor at the University of Santo Tomas Graduate School for Cultural Heritage Studies and the national coordinator for the Catholic Bishops Conference Episcopal Commission for the Cultural Heritage of the Church. Professor Zerudo will talk about the project Uswag Aren Arten also, uh, advancing the creativity and adaptability of weaving artisans in the third district of Leyte. He will be joined by Joval Gavase Francisco, excuse my pronunciation there, a local artisan collaborator through a recorded video. A translation of his message is available in the chat box for downloading. So let's now hear from Professor Eric and Joval. Thank you, Peter. Allow me to share my screen. I hope everybody's comfortable. And I'd like to greet everybody. A pleasant afternoon to all the woven networks and the weaving enthusiasts. Allow me to share with you our journey in this scoping research project on Uzwag Artesano. Advancing the creativity and adaptability of the basket weavers in the third district of Leyte. So this project is uh, supported by the British Council and uh, the Forest Foundation of the Philippines. Now, the title of our report was actually Baskets Have No Authors. The third district of Leyte Island, located in the eastern region of the Philippines, is composed of the municipalities of Iliaba, Tabango, Talubian, San Isidro, and Leyte. Now, this region is known as the Black Hole. It has consistently ranked at the bottom of the development performance indicators, and these figures are constantly exacerbated by the dramatic impact of natural disasters, typhoons, floods, and landslides. Located in the eastern seaboard, this region had the most devastating natural calamities in history. The Ormoc landslide tragedy in 1991, the Yolanda super typhoon in 2013, and the recent Odette super typhoon in 2021. Thus, this reality foregrounds the high poverty incidence and insurgency hotspot that plague the landscape. In 2019, our center worked with a uh, former board member, uh, Anna Veloso Twanson, who is now the congressman of this area. We embarked on a cursory heritage mapping project. In broad strokes, the mapping project identified and documented the heritages, both natural and cultural, reminiscent and evident of the ones identified in the landscape and in their localities. With this enriching experience, another opportunity was afforded to us by the British Council and the Forest Foundation. This time, the project is called Uswag Artisano, a scoping research project. Uh, this project intended to deepen the capacity of weaving artisans by recognizing now the risks and hazards as constant and by breaking ground into education, economic sustainability. So the scoping project intended to define the basket weaving tradition. So the artisans of that uh, district add value to the tradition creativity through co collaboration and cooperation to evolve climate change protocols to safeguard the tradition 
and um, to propose some sort of a support mechanism that will sustain the weaving industry. The Filipino methodology of this research included kwentuhan, kainan, laharan, pakiramdaman. So this is really storytelling, shared meals, shared trips, social emotional context building. Now the activity plan of the project used different methods, which included uh, literature review. We used the heritage online mapping experience or an online platform, field work face-to-face, -face, virtual lectures and workshops to ensure effective knowledge and skills engagement with hard to reach communities and that's often saddled by limited digital connectivity. So the Oswag Leite Cultural Mapping of 2019 produced heritage profiles of the five municipalities. Now the commonality amongst these five is that basket weaving, which utilized diverse wild, rural, natural materials sourced from the forest. The small patches of remaining forests continue to be valuable sources of roots, stems, vines, leaves, that become their baskets, mats, and containers of every day. Forest in so far is still the main source of non-timber products used in making different crafts. For the towns of the third district of Leyte, the forest cover has decreased since 2000, from 2000 to 2021. Despite the decrease in forest cover, the source of materials is still relatively intact since there are actually very few basket weavers who gather these non-timber materials. The basket, uh, for objective one, we try to define the basket tradition here, profiling the basket, the art of basket making and basket weavers. So for the study, a total of 22 artisans were engaged in the project. Most are located in the remote areas, often inaccessible in the municipalities. Many of the artisans are aging, as reflected previously in the uh, other report. Uh, for our uh, participants, most of them are from the 40s to the 60s. They've been doing basketry for the past four decades. Majority of the artisans learned weaving through observation, some by doing. Most of the mentors of these artisans were actually the relatives, and some learned it on their own. Basket artisans were located in areas where they also get their materials. So very often these are small patches of forests in their vicinity. Now these are some of the forest materials they gather for their weaving industry. So from bamboo to nito, tatan, tikog, and other local endemic flora. Typhoon Yolanda in 2013 was the most destructive typhoon that they experienced in their lives. This caused a total damage in the natural environment and forced some of them to look for other sources of livelihood. So some ventured into fishing, farming, and migrated to other places to look for work. Now for man-made threats to the uh, basket weaving industry, the absence of a uh, consumer market was um, high and the absence of access roads to bring their products to the market. For objective two, this concerns the um, organization. Actually, this was highlighted in the plenary article of Ms. Corazon Alvina, the director of the Museo Nakalamang Katutubo. Um, she underscored the close association of basket tradition to the agricultural cycle of the Philippines. The baskets that emerged were actually very diverse in use, function, form, design, materials, tools that were often reflected in the linguistics and vocabulary. Even with this complexity, the baskets were generally treated as lowly, nondescript containers, and all these baskets remained without authors. The need to organize a network was raised to recognize the artisans and acknowledge the creativity invested in every basket in every place. Other than the plenary presentation, Dr. Narot Flores of San Carlos Pangasinan also sent a moving video documentary entitled The Cattle Caravans of Ancient Kabuluan. This highlighted the demise of the basket trading route in Luzon. For objective number three, this was to highlight the resilience of the communities with regards to climate change, particularly the weaving industry. 
Ms. Anita Ogrimen, the president of BANIG, a nonprofit organization from Basai Samar, shared organizing challenges of the basket weavers along with their protocols in times of crisis. So she highlighted some uh, key points like organizing, source of materials, policy support, capacity building, education, transmission, disaster resilience, and the network and linkages. All the way from Bohol, we also heard the uh, concerns of architect Juvi Lagura, who shared to us the threats to their Antiquera basket industry. And he highlighted particularly the change in leadership and policies, the lack of able market, natural disasters, climate change, and even the lack of safeguarding mechanisms for the basket industry. Thus, he was really pitching for a strong organization and the LGU support, which were really urgently needed. With regards to transmission mechanisms, uh, we tried to call out ideas from various um, practitioners. The first one was a representative from the National Commission for Culture and the Arts. And Ms. Rene Talavera shared a flagship program of the NCCA, the School of Living Tradition. This is an informal center of learning in the communities where cultural masters transmit their knowledge and skills on a particular art, craft, and tradition to the young members of the community for appreciation and learning. Also, we heard the presentation of Ms. Rika Palis, who impressed upon everybody thoughts on livelihood education. Uh, according to her, educación may hugot or contextualized learning should be promoted. Hugot is a Filipino word which means to draw or to pull out a personal deep sentimental or emotional feeling coming from within. Um, according to her, the knowledge of basket weaving should be thought about in its first pinagmulan or sources, next is pinagdadaanan or process, and pinaglalaanan or uses. The last uh, resource group was actually the Manchester School of Arts. Um, Professor Alice Kettle, Rachel Kelly, and Dr. Michelle Stephens uh, sent over their very, very interesting video documentary on the textile weaving communities in Northern Luzon, a study that they entitled Digitization of Cordillera Weaving. So uh, the weaving learning can be efficient through different innovative techniques. Some of this could be independent, quick, low uh, resource, and learning can take place in so many different settings. So a lot of these inputs inspired many of our basket weavers to embark on new innovative ways of transmission. What were some of the insights that we gathered? First, research and documentation through anthropological research or mapping is fundamental to understand and appreciate the art of basketry. The word of the basket weaver goes beyond their immediate environment. Natural and man-made challenges continue to dramatically impact on the lives of basket weavers, and the transmission of knowledge and skills can have different modalities and trajectories. Some recommendations that we uh, advanced were uh, the utility of the home platform that can be used by other basket weaving communities, other parts of the Philippines. We are working towards a basket network of the Philippines or BASNET. This is a product of the scoping research project. Founding members are the ones from Leyte, so Basay in Samar, Antiquera Bohol, Echaga Isabela, San Carlos Pangasinan, Brooks Point, Palawan, Nueva Era Ilocos, Itbayat, Batanes, and Anilao Ituilo. Uh, we advance also uh, policy recommendations pursuant to the Wuba Network Scoping Grant. So this was written by uh, Congresswoman Anna Twasson. Then contextualized and localized climate change protocols were also suggested and formal and non-formal transmission mechanisms were also advocated. With that, I'd like to thank everybody for listening. Magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat. So I would like to share the video of uh, Mr. Jovel Francisco, a colleague uh, with an accompanying annotation and translation in your chat box. Thank you. Um, sa pagiging artisano, masasabi ko pong ang naging experience ko sa home craft 
is Hindi Madali. Uh, oh, adventurous. Masaya. Pero, mabigat. Napakahirap. Gaya lang ng when you collect your raw materials para sa sa yung craft you need to go to the the wild forest in order to collect it um uh, masasabi kong challenging because Uh, nasa challenge yung sarili na gumawa ng isang bagay na kaaya-aya at tatangkilikin ng isang mamamayan o sa lokal o sa ating susyudad. Challenging in my part of being an artisan because sa aking paggawa, marami po akong uh, kinoconsider like anong pattern ang gagawin ko o anong pattern ang gagamitin ko anong style ang i-apply ko para makabuo ng isang magandang craft Yung, yung craft na tatangkilikin talaga ng bawat mga mayan, hindi lang sa lokal, pati na rin sa, sa susyudad. Para sa akin, gumagawa ako ng isang craft. Yung special talaga, yung gawa mula sa aking puso. Dahil sa home craft, na-realize ko din na being an artisano or artisan, humaharap ng mga paghihirap, mga challenges in life dahil dahil hindi talaga madali ang pagiging artisano. Hindi madali dahil marami kang iisipin kung ang pulok ko ba ay magla-last o hanggang dito lang. Pero, kaming mga artisano talaga, gumagawa kami ng isang produkto, basi o sumasalamin. Sumasalamin sa aming mga pangarap, sa aming inspirasyon inspiration namin sa buhay yung kahirapan na idinudulot sa aming buhay yun ang nagiging daan namin nagiging lakas sa digan at ina-apply sa aming paggawa upang makagawa kami ng isang magandang likha yung gumagawa ka na inspired ka para makatulong sa sarili para makatulong sa iba at inspired ka na makagawa ng gumawa ng gumawa ng gumawa pa and masaya po ako dahil isa po ako sa isa po ako sa napuputikta 
at nag-preserve ng ating kultura. Dahil ang Pilipinas ay napakay- napakayaman ng gaya ng mga halaman na pwedeng pagkakitaan para sa sustainable na Hello. Hello. Ah. Thank you very much for the presentation there, Eric and Jovil. A uh, very inspirational speech. Thank you. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I think it would be very important just to recognize in terms of traditions such as basket making of course the biggest competition for the last 20 or 30 years has always been plastic objects which were cheap and easy to obtain and seemingly um, infinite amounts now of course we have a different attitude towards plastics Um, people recognize that they're polluting And of course, they're made of oil and oil is becoming more expensive. So there are some possible hopes in terms of changes towards a recognition of the value of these types of products, locally made, locally sourced products that don't pollute the environment, that when they are finished with use, um, either they're cherished for years or if they're damaged, they can return to the environment in a much safer way. So as well as the beauty and the aesthetics of the objects and also the value to the environment in terms of the supply of materials supporting the forest, there's also the fact that they are far less polluting and much more better for the environment, better for the people that use them because they don't cause these problems. So I think there's another aspect to this that is a, a, a yet another string to the bow, to use a very English phrase, about why this is a valuable product and a valuable project to be working on, as well as the importance of engaging new new practitioners in terms of making. Um, in a way, to, the fact that uh, Joel accepts the hardships is a uh, is a very impressive way, but. Um, let us hope that there's uh, more opportunities that he can gain in the future. So thank you very much for the presentation. And um, if I can now move on to our third presenter, um, please remember if you have any questions for uh, any of the presenters, um, if we can uh, then put them into the Q&A and we can see them beforehand and uh identify ones that are similar as well so that we can talk about more than one at a time so our last project entitled reviving the isn't a ikat weaving tradition embodying indigenous and cultural value in contemporary life and practice unfortunately dr anaretta is unable to present on her behalf we have professor annalyn Aiken salvador amores Uh, Dr. Salvador Amores is Professor of Anthropology and Director of the Musea Cordillera. I'm sure she'll be able to uh, (laughs) explain the presentation better better than I, at the University of Philippines Baguino and is currently conferred as a UP Scientist 3 in the university. She's also the project leader of the Cordillera Textiles Project, Cordillet Tex an interdisciplinary research team working on textiles of northern Luzon. She'll be joined by uh, Jeannie Lacay, who is an Islené weaver who started weaving when she wanted to baby wear her youngest child. Uh, Jeannie got the Islené weaving from her mum, 
she is excited to showcase the future ICAT projects uh, products that will show their interpretation of ICAT weaving as the new generation of weavers. Please welcome on screen Professor Ikin Anjini. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I'm presenting on behalf of Dr. Patricia Araneta, who cannot make it uh, this, e this evening. Uh, the title of the presentation is on um, reviving the Ica tradition, Ica tradition embodying indigenous knowledge and cultural values in contemporary life and practice. So the, the aim of the project is uh, to find out the earlier practices of the Isinai weaving tradition uh, that made their Ikat blanket one of the most sought after uh, textile in Northern Luzon. And uh, the Isinai ethnic group is found in Nueva Vizcaya in Northern Luzon. And our research questions are, uh, what are the traditional weaving practices of the Isinai in Nueva Vizcaya and its relation to neighboring communities in the Cordillera region, such as Benguet and Mountain Province and Ifugao. How was this made? What are the materials, techniques, and tools that were used in weaving? How, was the how is the practice perceived by the contemporary Isinai? And how can uh, retrieval of information on traditional practice be revived in the Isinai community? And this is our objectives. This is our objectives. First, to retrieve information of the Isinai weaving tradition uh, from the archives, historical documents, and other repositories. Second, to conduct pre preliminary research on the traditional weaving, forest resources, and raw materials from the Isinai communities. Third, to conduct a mapping of artisans, farmers, and weavers with notable practices and knowledge systems connecting their craft to sustainable research resource management, such as on weaving, cotton planting, and indigo dyeing. And the last one, which is, I think, uh, feasible, is to conduct a feasible study on the revival of traditional practices in the community, such as on the replanting of the original raw material, such as cotton planting, weaving, and uh, indigo tinctoria planting for natural indigo dyeing. So let me tell you uh, briefly about uh, the Isinai. The Isinai uh, ethno-linguistic group found in Nueva Vizcaya in Northern Luzon is one of the oldest languages uh, in the Cordillera. And uh, right now, their language is also in danger. It's a moribund language. And the speakers of the Isinai language are the elders and the next generation. And to the current generation, um, th does not really uh, speak the language. So at the moment, there is a revitalization project uh, on Isinai language, and they are slowly incorporating uh, this language uh, to schools. And what is important about this Isinai uh, dictionary, uh, which was published in 1744, and the only copy is found in uh, Biblioteca Nacional in Spain. And uh, this dictionary has some words that pertains to weaving, uh, natural indigo dyeing, and uh, ikat uh, tradition. So as early as 1744, this is already uh, documented. And there are also other um, dictionaries that came out, the Lengua uh, uh, Introduction, Estudio de la Lengua Castellana, which also mentions some of the weaving uh, traditions, uh, weaving terms, uh, which was published in 1889. And then another uh, dictionary, Vocabulario, Vocabulario and Isinai, which also includes other uh, neighboring languages in Northern Luzon, which was published in 19. 27. So from here, we jump off uh, uh, from the historical and archival sources that pertains to weaving. And then we also looked into historical photographs that shows uh, this particular ikat blanket. So this is a photograph that was taken in 1909 uh, by an American uh, colonial officer that was stationed in Northern Luzon, uh, Dean Worcester. And this is an ikat blanket of the Ibaloy uh, community in uh, Benguet. And they have this uh, 
particular tie-dyed blanket, uh, which would cost around six, no, 29 pesos during that time. And one, one, uh, six pesos is equivalent to one carabao. So the, the value of this is really very important for this Ibaloy speaking communities. Further research would show that this came from the Isinai uh, speaking communities in Tupacs. Uh, they were the ones who wove this particular and most coveted blanket, but was extinct or died uh, due to the introduction of uh, Christianity. So there are also uh, photographs of this particular um, blanket from family albums of the ones we've looked to in the Cordillera. And you can see here uh, that this particular blanket is called the traveling blanket because uh, from Dupax, uh, it went to Benguet, it went to Mountain Province, and then uh, in Ifugao. Although we know that Ifugao already know the technique of ikat dyeing, and uh, they have uh, and the Isinai have lost the tradition, and the Ifugao group have uh, learned uh, the process also either through exchange or intermarriage, or even uh, trade within the region. And as this blanket travels to different communities, they are called with different names. So it's called Uwas Pinutuan in Isinay, Adashang or Aladang in Ibaloy and Kankanay speaking communities. And it's called Kinutian in Ifugao. So this is an example of the last known Isinay blanket woven around 1980s uh, by the last ikat weaver, Lola Filipa Mangayat of Dupax del Sur. This is now in the St. Vincent Ferrer Church of Nueva Vizcaya. And this is now the current state you know, when we visited last uh, April 2022. So uh, there are no more ikat weavers uh, since the 1980s. And uh, the aim of this scoping project is to find ways on how to revive the ikat weaving tradition among the Isinai uh, through relearning it no, uh, from the Ifugao um, weavers. And uh, we also did some uh, scoping research uh, with the neighboring communities and forest in the Dupax vicinity. We also uh, got in touch with the Department of Agriculture and uh, the, the DNR, Department of Environment and Natural Resources, as well as the LGU of uh, Dupax del Sur. Um, in this particular scoping uh, research, uh, they have a lot of uh, forested areas and a lot of farming areas that can grow uh, crops but we did not find um, any material that pertains to cotton or to indigo. Uh, they also have this uh, watershed and protected forest area that could be a potential site for uh, probably planting cotton and indigo. So, uh, one of the objectives also of the scoping research is to, to find ways no, on how to revive this Ika tradition. So we also collaborated with uh, the Kiang and Weavers Association, or the Kiwa, and the Save the Ifugao Terraces Movement, or uh, SITMO. And uh, with the Cordillera Textiles Project of the UP Baguio and uh, Dr. Patricia Araneta, we had... Uh, initiated this ikat weaving workshop uh, in Kiangan. So what we did was to bring in um, ikat weavers, six master weavers um, in the area, um, two Isinai weavers from Nueva Vizcaya, one Bukalot, uh, she's the youngest uh, weaver in the group, one Kankanai weaver and one Ibaloy natural indigo uh, dire. So uh, in this particular workshop, uh, we, of course, visited the Ifugao uh, Museum in, in Kiangan, and we showed them the samples of textiles, uh, ikat textiles found in the area. So here, uh, 
this is a very significant uh, workshop because the participants have roots to uh, with Ika tradition, the Isinai, the, I the Kankana I Ibaloy of Benguet, and of course the Ifugao. And we also have one participant from Bontok. Uh, there's also an Ika tradition there. So we brought them together to reweave and relearn this particular process. So I'll, I'll show some photos. No? Uh, uh, it started with uh, winding threads from our master weavers, learning how to weave, um, tying, uh, weaving, and most importantly, uh, uh, natural dyeing. So this is these are all new uh, to our weavers and all the participants in the uh, ikat weaving workshop. But uh, they were very pleased with the result, no? doing hands-on and uh, learning by doing uh, in the entire process of, of ikat weaving. And uh, many of them are first time uh, ikat weavers and uh, used Philippine cotton uh, for this particular um, ikat weaving workshop. And this is Jeannie Lakai. She's one of our Isinai weavers. And uh, if, as you can see here, um, it's there's a, a the practice of ikat weaving uh, is there. No? They they learn the entire process, and these are the results of that ikat weaving workshop in Kiangan. And uh, of course, the one on top are uh, by the Ifugao masters, we uh, we were uh, masters, and then uh, below are the results no, of uh, the the weaving workshop. This is our teachers. And these are the participants of uh, the workshop. So um, what are the findings of our um, scoping research? First, uh, we validated that there is indeed an importance of ikat weaving tradition, but there is no physical interdependence of management and conservation of their natural resources and environment and ecosystems. So as a part as part of the recommendation, uh, we have to introduce cotton and indigo in available farm areas in um, Dupax del Sur. Um, and then of course, uh, the, the, the concept of the, the culture and language that are intertwined together. And of course, we have to teach them the, the weaving terms, the process on how it's done, how they look like, and how this could this is important in their Isinai culture. So it is important to integrate uh, this Isinai language to schools and also weaving in their curriculum. The second one is that there's no strong linkages of tradi traditional ikat weaving with what grows and flourishes in the natural areas and forested areas in Dupax uh, del Sur. Uh, primarily in ikat weaving, uh, the major uh, materials that are used there are cotton and uh, indigo tinctoria, the, the dye. Uh, so it is important to cultivate cotton and indigo in farmlands and fields that could be available to the community. So currently our team is studying this aspect on how uh, we can uh, cultivate cotton uh, in the area. And the third finding is to outline a framework of circular economy using the ikat weaving tradition as an entry point. Um, I failed to mention that the Isinai groups are found in three areas, uh, Dupax del Sur, Aritao, and also Bangbang. Bambang is highly uh, urbanized area in Dupax del Sur. Aritao, uh, some, have, some of them have... Uh, retained forest areas. And in fact, uh, they were awarded with the Kadti uh, in their claim for their ancestral domain, uh, which was applied in 2012. So recently they were um, awarded this 11.5 hectares and they are looking at this area uh, to plant cotton and to plant indigo and other forest products for the Isinai community. So we also propose uh, this uh, circular economy uh, for the Isinai 
for uh, on the regrowing of forests and revival of Isinai ikat weaving. Uh, this is the chart. And as you can see, uh, we propose that there should be a seed library or a nursery, nursery of indigenous local adapted species. And then, of course, reforestation, uh, agroforestry. So from here, um, this is important in revitalizing their cultural identity. And like I said, the entry point is on ikat weaving, weaving. And primarily, it starts with education and training. So uh, the processing, uh, or the cultivation of cotton, and then the processing of cotton to thread. Uh, from uh, the processing of plant dyes or medicinal herbs, et cetera, uh, for this one. And then, of course, uh, this could be uh, transformed into textile to blankets, um, training on product development in relation to garments, then design orientation and collaboration. It is also important to integrate uh, these uh, practices into the education and training curriculum of the SNI. So it is important to uh, collaborate with the Department of Education and the LGU and schools and other universities in, in that particular area. And then we hope to develop also uh, training on uh, development of teaching materials, instructional materials, uh, which we hope to achieve. No? Uh, currently, there is a community dictionary um, that is being currently in process in, uh, for publication at the University of the Philippines in Baguio. And then eventually uh, you have this uh, um, training on accounting and basic entrepreneurship, social enterprise, and then you eventually have the sales and marketing, uh, distribution of cotton and dye products and other textile products coming from this um, um, circular economy and eventually uh, income sharing to uh, for reforestation program, sustaining plants, dyeing, uh, healing, and its local economy. So as a postscript to end uh, this presentation, uh, Uh, the story of the sharing of the ikat weaving tradition from Isinai to Ifugao and back again to Ifugao is so compelling. More than any political mancha on unity, it is a harbinger for the coming together of communities that may still be divided politically, though not culturally. Ikat is a Malay word that means ties that bind. And from these communities, uh, from Benguet, Mountain Province, and Ifugao, it is one tie that binds them through the Ika tradition. And other um, projects uh, also are under underway, such as the uh, Habi Textile Council. Uh, we collaborated with a documentary about this story, about the traveling blanket and uh, the Ika uh, blanket. And then we hope to continue weaving workshop in Isinai communities in collaboration with Corditex cultivation of cotton and indigo in Isinai communities in collaboration with other institutions. And of course, uh, this weavers exchange and networking. It is through the, the weavers exchange and gathering of weavers uh, conversations that we were able to have this uh, exchange with local weavers, you know, willing to learn, relearn, revitalize and revive the ikat blanket. So from there, I would like to thank everybody for um, listening. And if you have questions, uh, kindly let me know. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, Hello. I think Jeannie uh, Lakai uh, will be giving a talk as well uh, for her uh, regarding her experiences on the Ika tradition weaving. 
Okay. Um, good morning and good afternoon to all of you. I am Gina Lakay, an Isinai weaver and owner of Aruga Hand, Hand Movements. Aruga is a Filipino term that, that means scare. Just a brief, brief background of how I started weaving and how Aruga started, weave, started as well. Um, I just want to share. Wait, sorry. Okay, um, just a brief background of Araga. It all started because I chose to baby wear my youngest son. One of the many benefits of baby wearing is that it creates a sense of security for the baby. It creates a stronger bond between the mother and the child. Traditionally, our ancestors carry their young with a long piece of cloth, which they call aban, a woven wrap in English. Though there are a lot of modern baby carriers nowadays, like ring sling and buckle carriers, which is easier to use, I still chose to baby wear with an aban because it is like dancing. It creates movement where you and your child only understand. Baby wearing for me is not only about carrying your child and going about your business, but it is about the relationship you create with your child. I want my baby to enjoy the baby wearing journey. That's why I want him to feel comfortable. I bought and tried all kinds of woven wraps I see locally and abroad. Most are machine woven, especially the ones that are made abroad, and some are hand woven here in the Philippines. I can't find exactly the texture and softness I wanted for our aban. That's why I, I thought of making one for us. I started researching and learning about weaving, read and watch videos on how to weave. Basically, I taught myself how to weave. When my mom learned that I was already weaving baby wraps for other parents, this was the time she told me about the history of Isinais as one of the best weavers during the early days. I was surprised because now I know and understand why I got into this craft. I understand why it is easy for me to understand the house of weaving because it is in my blood. As I learned more about our weaving culture, my reason for this weaving adventure got deeper and more meaningful. During the pandemic, last October 2020, I taught weaving to my fellow Isinais in our province. We had, we had 12 participants ages 18 years old to 65 years old. Most of them were 35 years old and below. My goal is to bring back the weaving tradition to the Isinais because it was not passed on to the younger generations and we lost it for, for a long time. At that time, I taught them the weaving technique I knew which is the upright loom weaving with four shaft looms. Because of this livelihood project, our weavers were given the opportunity to have a stable income. They were able to survive the pandemic. Dr. Ikin or doc, Dr. Annalyn Amores researched about the Isinai culture and language. She mentioned about ikat as the traditional weaving technique used by our, our ancestors. I tried ikat. I researched about it, but there were no accurate videos showing the details on how to prepare the designs on the warp. So I still did an ikat where I randomly dyed colors on the warp before weaving. It came out beautiful, but it was not the ikat technique of our ancestors. Then came Miss Patricia Araneta, who was the reason why we had this ikat weaving workshop granted by the British Council, held last July at Kiangan Ifugao. It was an exciting and an humbling experience that I had to temporarily forget about what I learned to be able to fully accommodate this new knowledge. It is a totally different weaving technique and I am so happy to finally have this new skill. Ikat is a different weaving technique. It is a tedious process to make one project. 
the gist of the whole process is that the warp threads are dyed first before weaving. The designs you see in an ikat fabric is, is obtained through tying and dyeing. I learned during the workshop while we were sharing stories during the early days, dyeing yarns is sacred and done usually dur during the night when everyone is asleep. As an Isinai, I felt lucky and thankful that the Ifigaos were willing to teach us this weaving technique. They still consider us as Cordillerans, their sisters and brothers, despite of not being part of the Cordilleras politically now. Kuya Marlon, a weaver and spokesperson of the Ifugao weavers, mentioned that they don't usually teach this weaving method to other people outside the Cordilleras. This workshop is very important to us to be to be able to reclaim and preserve our culture. Kuya Marlon also gave me an indigo seedling for us to plant in Dupax del Sur, our Isinai town. Indigo is the plant where we get the natural color indigo from. This seedling is very symbolic. It, is, it symbolizes the unity of the indigenous people from the Cordilleras and helping out their brothers and sisters to reclaim the lost tradition. I think this is the beginning of finally bringing back the traditional weaving technology we once had. To teach more Isinais and give them the opportunity to have a sustainable income without them looking for jobs away from their families. As a modern weaver who's already e equipped with the traditional Ika technology, I am excited to produce handwoven products with the fusion of tradition, traditional and modern techniques. Keep us in mind and watch out for the future handwoven of our handwoven ikat products, a modern Isenai weaver's inter interpretation of ikat. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you very much, Zini, uh, and thank you, thank you to both of you for the presentation. I was particularly interested about two aspects. One is about the use of circular economy as a principle to help develop the project um, the importance of local materials or materials moving within the philippines rather than talking about international imports which are quite problematic and the other is the connection of uh, creating a product but talking about the social importance of uh, the baby carrying as part of the rationale for making it's not just about profit it's also about a so an important social activity um, that really has values in its own right so thank you so much for introducing that into the project and i think that connects with the fact that all three projects there is another aspect to this it is not just about making things it is also about connections between people and connections for communities that i think is a very valuable thing to make sure that that is emphasized when you talk about the project so thank you so much to you both for that uh, connection um, yes, could i now ask all the all the panelists to um if you could switch on your uh cameras now um to join us for the panel session I'm going to uh, prioritize the audience questions for the panel, um, but I am going to amalgamate some of the questions that have been uh, sent in uh, so that some have been sent to one individual and people have answered them already in the question answer to that person. But if I can draw those questions out a little bit so that they connect for everybody. Um, so, but just to mention, um, if people want to continue asking a QA, and a if they can type it in, you may get a direct answer um, as a response as well as a typed answer. So um, the questions that uh, I'd like to pick up on, um, there's one that is uh, sent by Pamela, and she particularly initially asked Carmen about uh, what inspired her to start her store. But we also have some other questions from other uh, people asking uh, how people have got involved in the projects. So I would be very interested in hearing from the all of the collaborators. So from the people working in the communities and, and how they see possible international collaborations in future as well um so if i can open that up as a 
question is there anybody who has an immediate response to it that they can um why what motivates you in doing this and uh what do you hope to get out of the project in terms of connections and working in the future internationally or with international partners maybe so i should start oh please thank you all right uh with the ICA tradition uh with the project uh because we know that is that it is also a practice in other southeast asian uh countries uh, uh, I mean, the Ica tradition is also found in Southeast Asia, and also with the rest of the Philippines, we have still uh, Ica tradition in, Visay uh, in Mindanao, so we want to do more comparative in terms of the approach and to connect that to a wider connection in Southeast Asia. So at the moment, uh, the, the biggest challenge really is finding these raw materials and cultivating them. And uh, we want to start with the local communities, such as uh, the group in Isinai, uh, also in Ifugao. So we have to really uh, plant this uh, cotton material for weaving and also for the dyeing, which is, I think, a, 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 an utmost concern because of the scarcity of this material. So that's a priority. And then in terms of its uh, research, in terms of comparative research, we want to expand also collaborating with other ICAT dying, commu dying uh, communities in other parts in Southeast Asia. So it's uh, it, for me, my, my recommendation is start to start within, to learn and master the process, and also to exchange with other neighboring um, communities um, who are doing also ICAT tradition. Thank you very much. Um, does anybody else have any other contributions, any different motivations? I'm aware, Carmen, that you typed a response, but um, not everybody can see that. So perhaps if you could um, read. Yeah, I'll read go that. after Sir Eric. I think um, he raised his hand. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, who would like to go first? I, I give you the option. <laughs> Carmen, Carmen, you can do the. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So polite, Eric. Thank you. Uh, Carmen, thank you. So, um, as a quick response, not to the question. Well, actually, I come from the development sector, so I, uh, I'm a nurse who fell in love with the community. So now, craft communities, um, specifically, and I think um, it's really my passion for women's economic empowerment. So, um, through a project that I worked on um, for almost five years. It, it was called the Great Women Project. I met all these amazing artisan enterprises. And um, the project has ended. And eventually, like it led me to identifying that, how can I leave these people behind? So how can I forget about these people? And what I see now is that what I'm doing um, is really my life's calling and mission to be serving alongside craft communities and women no, particularly where they are. So um, bringing that on a Southeast Asian perspective right now, we are not just working in the Philippines, but also looking for reaching out to our um, brothers and sisters across the region um, to really also map and create databases that will be democratized and will be available. Uh, and um, through these databases, then we can find um, we can find it easier not to access markets because they will be seeing how great and excellent the products are from Southeast Asia. So. That's the inspiration, and that's you not know, the reason for being for, yeah, from my end. Thank you, Carmen. Uh, Eric, please. Yes, I think on our part, um, as a conservation center, uh, very often we've been uh, perceived as very much on the conservation side of built heritage, but um, it's not very often that we are able to delve on the intangibles and the skills and the expressions of the people. So when we were given the challenge to um, 
can you help this particular district in Leyte, which was very, not very popular compared to the other districts of the island. Uh, we said, maybe we can look into this, particularly that long-standing query of um, how really to mainstream that understanding of mainstreaming heritage, culture, arts, history into the mindset of our policy makers. In a developing setup like the Philippines, um, this sector, the arts, culture, heritage, history, it, it's very often relegated, no? the least of the priorities. And you must be able to present to these policymakers a particular language that they understand. And this particular language should have a particular prototype for them to pick it up. Because if they don't pick it up, there'll be no policy, there'll be no, no framework, no structure that they can follow through. They will always ask if this sector, the arts, heritage, history, will it feed the people? Where does it enter into the equation of economics? And that's very difficult. So we started pulling together, uh, let's map out first, do the people really understand what they have? Again, uh, from, the, uh, from the thoughts of uh, Mami Kin, uh, it's really introspection. You really have to understand what, what's left, what you have. And from there, try to pick up the pieces and how these pieces are put together. How do you thread them? Uh, how do you work out a narrative? And this narrative should be translatable to something very, very tangible, something that's very understandable to the policymakers. So we always link up with these policymakers, the LGU, with the governor, that we have a prototype. You know? It's something that you can look into it. So, it's gradual and the prototype should be multi-trajectory. It can go to maybe to, towards education, maybe towards the capacity building, maybe to, to industry, even to infrastructure, maybe even to tourism, for as long as it's grounded on the culture of the people. You know, there has to be that utter respect that they should be able to represent themselves and that's their voice. And how are you going to pick this up as policymakers? And I think that's very empowering and definitely that's very dignifying to all of these dying crafts that we have. So that was really the motivation for this whole project. Uh -huh. Thank you, Eric. Um, Jeannie, is there anything you would like to um, add to that? It's interesting to know from uh, a community, a weaver's perspective, um, do you feel there is anything you particularly gained from the project, would like to gain from the project in future uh, from working with others? Yeah, um, yeah. Be, uh, because as, as of now, I'm still um, at loss of how the Isinai lived before. So I'm still um, studying and um, discovering how we were as easy nice before and with the help of doc 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 Eakin, um she she was the one who who told us about um the weaving traditions before and how we were as a, as as an easy nice before so um if we bring this uh, if if we bring this internationally um it will what do you call this it will uh, <laughs> don't, don't worry yes it, it takes time for the idea to form so yeah it will we, help we'll others wait. yeah it <laughs> will help saying. also others to uh, to learn about their tradition and it will also help others to know about um where they where they really came from so me as a weaver in a 39 year old i i consider myself young so it will be an inspiration also to others that um learning about your 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 traditional traditional culture or heritage um is also important for young for for young for the young generation and to to continue it thank you very much thank you um this the second question i'd like to ask um 
connects to a number that have been asked um, that Connie asked uh, about Filipino consumer views about Filipino handicrafts in terms of buying and using them. And uh, I'm just scrolling up slightly. Uh, Mitzi also asked um, about specifically about mat weaving in terms of uh, a business model. So I'm quite interested that we have a, a varied uh, types of products that people are talking about. So the uh, the textiles that are being created, the woven products, the baskets that are being made. Where do you see them in terms of uh, consumers, in terms of current interest? And is there any opportunities that you can see for the area you're working on or handicrafts in general about extending interest or extending consumer markets in the Philippines and possibly elsewhere, but uh, particularly thinking about local or uh, maybe sort of local cities or even across the Philippines nationally. I don't know if anybody wants to jump in immediately for this. Um, any takers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Let me go ahead, Peter, because um, I, I answered Connie uh, that uh, we conducted a customer validation no, survey. Uh, and um, based on what I also have been asking around wherever I go, like within the last two months, well, at least here in the Philippines, you know, um, in terms of customers um, aged 35 to 55, so that's uh, like roughly millennials and then Gen X, those who are capable of buying, there really is a drive, no? especially um, as part of economic recovery, you know, um, considering the effects of COVID. They want to buy local, but yeah, the source of information, awareness, where to, is really the... Um, what's missing so they end up just shopping no in the famous applications but yeah and when when asked no um um in my recent trips uh, uh, just last month uh, I went to New York and the shop that I was able to visit there um the person said that there is still a de de demand, not just for Philippine handmade, no, but actually anything handmade um, and those that are really imperfect because they know that the hands of people no, um, were the ones no, that prepared that. So I guess the demand is there, but yeah, more information is needed to provide, um, to be provided no, to these people who are part of the market. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else have any contributions to make to that as a question? <clears throat> You're all being very polite. <laughs> Please, Eric. Yes, uh, I think Peter, on our part, uh, we're talking here of baskets. Uh, and uh, what's surprising is the fact that uh, the basket weavers were so used to doing the very much functional and utilitarian designs. Um, and they just felt that they've reached that sort of plateau. No, <laughs> that's it. Yeah. It's a period. Yeah. But the moment they collaborate uh, with some master designers, they collaborate with other weavers, they realize there, there are a lot of other possibilities. You know, the way they they would uh, mix and match different materials, uh, the way they would do the handles, they would do. So, and when you open this to an avenue, a trade fair, um, they realize that there is a market, people buy. <laughs> people mm -hmm. buy, it's quite overwhelming. It's very uplifting to many of them. So um, I think it's also a matter of um, providing them all these possible avenues it uh, gives them that particular drive. They get very excited of uh, what will be the new possibilities, the new potencies of new designs that they can come up with. And they really get overwhelmed if one buyer would really buy a whole stock. No, <laughs> but uh, they couldn't believe 
that it's possible for them. They were so used to thinking, you know, in small retail uh, scales, but eventually when people get to corner a particular design, uh, they really get uplifted. Uh, what I'm trying to say is um, there will be designs that just like in our previous studies where during the American period in the Philippine Craftsman uh, anthology, they all had to standardize the design because all of these were really made for commercial export markets in the United States. But now it's really the handcrafted, very distinct, one of a kind. There's a particular market for that. And it's, it, it is possible they can still come up with that. And they also would like to venture into that kind of market. You know? So every time we now move to different trade fairs in Davao, you go to uh, the Manila Fair, you go, you see something one of a kind pieces that's also very distinct and very uh, outstanding. You know? So I think these are new markets that we may have to tap as well no other than the traditional ones that we have developed so far. So thank you very much. Thank you. It's interesting that uh, Carmen's talking about the, um, the desire on one side from uh, buyers for something that isn't perfect. But on the other side, there is the, the idea of something that is exceptional, that is better and unique. And I think um, uh, Jeannie's when she was talking about the developing the product, developing the baby carrier and having something that is actually the best one possible and maybe better than an industrial product because it is more connected to the making and the person is, is one of the things that's very interesting about handicrafts, that it has both sides of it to this. Um, the last question I'd like to ask is uh, about, uh, which came in from a question from Simon, about alternative learning programs. And have you encountered any of the learning programs to try and uh, bring younger people into the program? Obviously, there's <laughs> there has been some where it's particularly part of the program. But um, has that been connected with wider initiatives or has it always been in so, just inside your program in terms of trying to connect? Have you found other partners outside that you can meet with and work with? Okay, can I start? Yes, uh, please. Yes, yeah, so uh, the Cordillera Textiles Project, uh, its main advocacy is really to reach out to schools and to teach the younger generation to appreciate uh, primarily on weaving um, and all this uh, uh, traditional crafts that we have uh, from coming from indigenous communities. In fact, we have already published uh, children's books on uh, traditional weaving uh, featuring the uh, master weavers from a, a certain community. And uh, these are published and these are distributed for free to schools uh, in the Cordillera region. And I think some of them are used as part of the uh, instructional materials no? uh, for, for some schools. But of course, it is also difficult to penetrate uh, the, 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 the schools because they have their own system, the tradition, I mean, the, the conventional way. And we hope that uh, schools and the Department of Education can actually consider uh, this alternative uh, media for teaching uh, by learning by doing. So for instance, using the looms, um, doing the actual weaving in itself uh, should be part of, of this curriculum uh, to teach our younger generation and to have this greater appreciation of traditional crafts. Um, we are hoping uh, that uh, it could be also included as a course in the tertiary level. No, uh, in 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 uh, BSU, the Bengal State University used to have a course on home economics, majoring weaving, uh, but that uh, disappeared in the 1960s. So we hope to bring it back to professionalize uh, weaving, not only as a vocational um, course, but as a as a as a as a course in itself uh, for for schools, both high school and. Uh, 
for the uh, college um, degree you know, on weaving. Yeah. So we have collaborated with um, uh, some schools already in the, in the local level, and we hope to bring it to a higher level in terms of incorporating that in the curriculum. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, uh, Eric, you have a, want to make a contribution? Yes. Um, in fact, one of our objectives in the uh, whole project was really into um, introducing this to the uh, curriculum of uh, the K to 12 in, in, in that particular province. Um, we did a prototype of the mainstreaming into the curriculum from the summer side, no? Uh, yeah. The framework is there and how it expands, you know, the, the mindset was from the younger years, it's just the household and then it expands, expands, expands as you go and advance, you not know, in higher years. So there's a certain group, a curricularist, they call it curricularist, on how to use many of these uh, the terminologies, the icons, uh, the symbols as you go through the different levels. Uh, we're trying to do that for baskets here in Leyte and uh, it may take a while because we still really have to uh, plot out, I think, what are the elements that you would like to tell regarding baskets, no? from source materials to the stories related to the baskets, to the, to the weaves, uh, to the numbering, uh, to the count. Um, so maybe a comparative with other baskets from other parts of the Philippines and other baskets, other parts of the world. So um, that kind of curriculum development uh, is being negotiated you know, with the Department of Education. Um, if they, I, I think they're also open to it, especially now that the Department of Education is very strong into contextualization and localization and they need really good materials that come from, uh, I think from many of us like the scholars, no? And they will need these materials. It's a matter of how to translate it according to the grade levels, the particular level of language that they need and what activities will be appropriate for that particular uh, grade level. So there are many, many uh, technologies now that would enhance the, the exposure of the uh, school children. But at the same time, uh, maybe uh, the mindset is more technologies, more exposure, repetitive, because the attention span of the young generation is very short. It's very, very short. So uh, they have to be kept busy. <laughs> <laughs> or else they can keep that whole craft behind. So we're still doing something like that. No, I think for, for our little late uh, group. Yes. Mm. Thank you, Eric. Uh, Jeannie, please. Yes. yes. Um, f um, as a weaver and uh, an, uh, a business owner, what we do in our workshop, uh, in our weaving studio, is that we offer weaving workshop workshop, simple basic weaving workshop for tourists uh, with the help of the Department of Tourism. So what they do is that, you know, young the, the young generations, they really want to uh, Instagram, TikTok, and all. So what we do is we offer them um, uh, weaving activities that they can do whenever they're in Dupac del Sur. So if they go to our workshop, uh, our, our studio, uh, we teach them the 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 basic weaving like the frame weaving which uh, they can finish in a day so what we also do here in manila is that what since i'm based here in manila is that i i post and offer that we are open for um for weaving workshop on this day and it gets um a lot of um young 
you know young people to to participate in those mm-hmm. kinds of workshops so even if it's just for tiktok or just for instagram purposes it will steer the creativity of some so we will be able to get pe- mm-hmm. more people to be interested to know about this yeah. so that's one of our small efforts to to spread the weaving you know technology to to anyone who are interested Oh, that's great to hear. I think it's also important just to recognize that as well as maybe there are some who are so interested that they take it up, but also that it demonstrates how hard it is as a craft and appreciation for the practice from having a go is also a very useful thing. So you're building your consumers as well as building your artisans in terms of doing this. So it's wonderful on both counts. Um, I, I'm aware that we're really up to time and we have slightly gone over. So um, please join me in thanking the panelists for an, an extended um, staying with us and, and all making great contributions. So thank you very much to the panelists. Um, the presentations will be, uh, they are recorded and they will be available for everybody. But um, that's everything from me. So thank you for listening and I'll hand you back to Kai. Thank you for facilitating the discussion, Peter. And thanks to everyone for participating and sharing your thoughts. Before we continue, let's pause for a poll question to gather your feedback on how we can improve the next sessions. We will be with you for the next two days. So how do you feel? after the presentations and discussions. Are you excited because there are things you'd like to try out or apply and people you want to collaborate with? Or are you happy because there's some sort of validation and hope that extinct weaves could be brought back to life and documented? Do you feel neutral? A lot of information, you're still processing it. Or a bit confused because it comes up against something you already thought you knew, all right? Everyone is happy about it. We've got 48%. That is very good to know. It was actually very inspiring. I found myself taking down notes and wanting to um, see how can how we can apply it to a weaving community here in Cebu. Poll number two. My knowledge of sustainability, that's your knowledge of sustainability and forest management has improved through the webinar. Do you strongly agree? It is a firm in your mind now what goes on behind forest preservations and the communities that live in it. Do you agree? Um, it's more than a concept to you now and it's, it's tangible. Are you undecided? There are things that you're not entirely sure of. Do you disagree? It's still overwhelming and confusing or do you strongly disagree? Maybe a little clearer or a takeaway study Don't forget to check the British Council website. We will be uploading the sessions and the recordings later on for your reference. All right. We have 56% of you agree. And this is very hopeful as well. Um, There's so much that we learned. And actually, it it tells you about the diversity of our uh, people in the Philippines. So thank you for that. Thank you for answering the polls. And thank you for being here today. From our esteemed panel and speakers, we've learned ways in which indigenous knowledge factors in forest preservation, how craft communities are essential for livelihood, culture, and forest lands to thrive. We definitely had a great time and we hope to see you tomorrow for another day of inspiration and learning. Be sure to join us in the next two days, especially on the last day, as we launch a virtual exhibit entitled From Land to Loom, From Fiber to Form, Woven Networks Research Projects. You see that on your screen right now? Just a few reminders. If you wish to review the research studies presented in the sharing sessions or read through the transcripts of the translations, Um, from some of our speakers who were speaking in uh, Tagalog, you may access them in the British Council website from the 2nd of September onwards. Our staff are on it. 
it will be archived there for your reference. In the meantime, you may email us for inquiries through marianne.palacio at britishcouncil.org.ph. The email address is on your screen, so take note of it or screen grab it. If you would like more references for a study that you would like to do inspired by the presentations today, go right at it. We will also be sharing, as I mentioned earlier, recordings. So be sure to follow British Council's social media channels at PH British on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and use the hashtags Woven Networks, Crafting Futures, and Let's Grow Together. You see that on your screen as well. If you want to post about this event. Once again, this is Kay, and thank you for joining us today. I'll see you tomorrow.